Okay, now if you remember, we, we started this module with the story of H.M. And H.M., to remind you, was a, a young man who suffered from epilepsy, which wasn't treatable by any medications at the time. And it was also a time period when there was a lot of um, interest in neurosurgery as a potential cure-all for all sorts of um, mental health uh, problems. And so HM uh, ended up getting a pretty dramatic surgery that uh, resulted in the removal of tissue from the temporal lobes on both sides of his brain. And although it was fairly successful in limiting his epileptic seizures, it left him with a profound anterograde amnesia. And so he was unable to form any new memories about people, places, events in his life, uh, which made it impossible for him to lead a normal life and live without, um, live on his own without any supervision. So it's pretty devastating. And HM's report, thanks to the classic study of Scoville and Milner, which we read, um, really had a dramatic effect on psychology at the time. Uh, and a lot of uh, labs, uh, a lot of academic psychologists began to study the, the hippocampus. Um, and physiological psychologists in particular were in a position to study the hippocampus because rats and mice and monkeys have a hippocampus too and it was possible to use physiological methods in order to study the hippocampus. Hippocampus is a, a really interesting uh, brain structure. It's a very large brain structure that has um, kind of a unique uh, set of connections within that structure. Um, it's in fact that I, I think I mentioned in an earlier class that because these neurons in the hippocampus um, mutually excite one another, that is a reason why that part of the brain can be prone to epileptic seizures, but it also seemed to be uh, potentially a, a, a circuit that might underlie memory, certainly because of the case study of HM, um, people wanted to figure out what is it about the way these neurons connect together that enable memories to be formed. And so physiological psychologists did what physiological psychologists do. Remember, we use physiological methods, which are primarily those that um, either reduce or enhance or measure activity in the central nervous system. Um, so one of the primary methods at the time, still very common method, is to study a brain area, you lesion it, you get rid of it, and then um, observe what sort of psychological processes are no longer functioning, the so-called lesion behavior approach. And so uh, after HM, uh, rats were given hippocampus lesion, were given various memory tasks like the ones that, uh, the maze studies that we've talked about with Lashley, um, and, uh, and others, and there was an expectation that if you get rid of the hippocampus, then you're going to disrupt um, performance on these memory tests. And then another set of studies that were done were electrophysiological studies, which uh, would put animals in some kind of learning situation while neurons were being recorded, that is, while their firing rate was being uh, measured, um, during uh, retention and recall uh, stages of some sort of memory uh, task. But the early um, studies on the hippocampus in physiological psychology labs were pretty discouraging um, because it turned out that very few people were reporting that lesioning the hippocampus had near the kind of effect that, um, that it had on HM. So animals would learn mazes, they'd get hippocampus lesions, and they do perfectly fine after those hippocampus lesions. And so that led um, to the idea that maybe the hippocampus is important for memory in humans, but isn't important for memory in simpler organisms. But it turned out that the real problem was that um, many of the memory tasks that were being used were not the right kinds of memory tasks. So one of the major um, discoveries from studies of HM was that there are multiple memory systems, that there's a distinction between our explicit declarative memories and our implicit procedural memories. And many of the tasks that you would do with a rat 
uh, were really more like implicit procedural memories than they were like explicit declarative memories. Um, HM, you'll remember, did perfectly fine learning the mirror drawing task even after his hippocampus was uh, lesioned, which is kind of like a, a rat running a maze, I guess. Um, what, where he didn't do well is if you asked him, have you ever seen this memory task before? Have you ever met these researchers before? He would have to say he, he didn't remember. Um, so how do you test a rat's ability to remember things? You know, you can't ask a rat, what did you have for breakfast? What did you do last weekend? Um, those are the sorts of things that HM would have a problem with. Uh, but a lot of the things that HM could still do well were procedural tasks, which is kind of the easiest type of memory test to put to a rat. And so it took a while um, before scientists developed memory tasks that were hippocampally dependent, that is, memory tasks that were disrupted by hippocampus lesions, those that might stand in for an explicit declarative memory task in humans. And one of the first ones was the Morris water maze test. And this picture here uh, shows a picture of a mouse um, doing a version of the Morris water maze, although this is a little bit different from uh, the main Morris water maze task. So you basically have this kitty swimming pool. Probably we've all been in one of these at some point in our lives, right? Um, and, uh, and somewhere in the, in the pool, same place every day, every trial, is a little platform here that the mouse can swim to, get on in order to escape the water. And sometimes in the beginning, when the mouse is first being trained or the rat's first being trained on this task, uh, you might have some kind of visible um, structure above the surface of the water to make it easier for the mouse to find it. But you don't actually need to do this. And so in the most common version of the Morris water maze task, this, this um, little lighthouse structure here doesn't exist. Instead, it's a clear platform. And the platform sits just under the surface of the water. And the water is not clear in a Morris water maze like it is in this picture. Typically, it's, it's made cloudy um, using some kind of white uh, paint or something like that. So when you put the mouse in this swimming pool, it looks around, it can't see the platform. The platform is just under the surface of the water. Now mice and rats swim uh, well, they're good swimmers, but they don't like being in the water. And so typically when you, when you drop the, the mouse in, the rat in, at one of the positions around the pool, um, the first thing they do is panic and try to get their way out. They'll turn around, They'll try to climb up the, the surface of the walls. That won't work. So they'll kind of start swimming around the edge of the pool looking for some kind of escape and typically getting more and more frantic as it goes on. Again, the good swimmers, the researchers watching them, there are no danger of drowning. But the mouse is highly motivated to figure out how to escape being in the water. And so eventually, usually after two or three minutes, they'll start kind of randomly swimming their way through the, the pool. And eventually, by luck, they're going to hit the platform and they're going to climb out and typically they shake themselves, they try to get dry. Um, and at that point, the researcher comes over, picks the mouse up, puts it under a heat lamp, dries it off, puts it under a heat lamp, lets it, lets it get uh, comfortable again, and then puts it back in the swimming pool. And typically, the very next thing that the mouse does is exactly the same thing. Tries to get out the side, swims around randomly, um, and may eventually bump into the platform. But eventually, the mouse learns there's a platform in the pool. It's always in the same place. If I just swim to the platform, I'm going to be OK. That's the learning that's involved. That's the solution to the maze here. Um, and so they get pretty good at swimming straight to the platform eventually. In the researcher times, how long does it take them to escape the maze and get to the platform? But the thing that makes this a uh, different sort of maze is that the mouse could be put in in different starting positions. And so the way to get to the platform the fastest, because you can't see the platform, is to realize 
where you are in this environment relative to the platform. If the, if the researchers always put me in at this place right here, then I would know, turn my body 20 degrees, swim for 13 seconds, and I'm going to hit the platform. But if the researcher puts me in over here, and I turn 20 degrees, and I swim for 13 seconds, I'm not going to hit the platform. So that strategy doesn't work. That's the kind of strategy that would work in a normal maze, but it doesn't work in this sort of maze, because you could be put into this maze in any different position. And so what you might do, if you were in this situation, is you'd get into the pool, and you'd look up around the room, and you'd say, okay, the the door is over here, and the window is over here, and the clock is over here, so therefore I must be here, and the platform must be here, and then you would swim straight toward it. Um, it's, uh, it's probably like what you would do on campus, right? If you, you know, m m if we were actually on campus. Mondays, Wednesdays, Fridays, your class before lunch is in Orlando Hall. But Tuesdays, Thursdays, your class before you get lunch is in Bush Science Center. So you walk outside, you realize where you are, you call up a map of the campus inside your head, and you walk straight to where you're going to get lunch. The, the mouse or the rat does the same thing. And one proof of that is if you, let's say, put the, the mouse in this water maze every day for, you know, for 10 trials. They learn the maze really, really well. You do that for five days, and they're, they're always, no matter where you drop them in, they're swimming straight toward the platform. If on the final day of the test, you sneak into the room beforehand, and you change, let's say, the paintings on the walls and the posters on the walls, and you, you move everything clockwise um, from one wall to the next, the mouse is clearly using those as a cue to where to swim because they now swim to the wrong place. Okay, so you can trick the mouse by changing the landmarks in the room. Just like, and this is much harder to imagine, but just like if you walked out of, of your classroom one day and, you know, the chapel had been moved <laughs> to the other side of campus and, and uh, the mill's lawn was suddenly where Bush was, you'd be pretty disoriented and confused and you wouldn't be able to find your way to where you were going. Um, you can play those sorts of games in a small laboratory with animals and when they do that, they, they make the mistakes that you would, that you would expect. Um, so I'm going to show you a video uh, of a mouse in this, uh, or maybe it's a rat, um, I can't remember, but um, this is a more modern version of the Morris water maze where there's an infrared camera sitting above the pool and tracking the, the rat's swim path. And you'll see this is late in training uh, when the animal's really good at the task. So the mouth's been put in the pool, platform's over here, mouse a rat rather makes one wrong turn turns around and ends up sitting on the platform probably took them like 10 seconds and these computers can then give you not only how long did it take to get to the platform but how long was that line were they making a lot of loops a lot of wrong turns or were they pretty much going straight to the platform and that's one measure of uh, how well the mouse uh, the rat or mouse has learned the maze so here's a an example of some data and here what they're measuring is the swim distance. So the swim distance is going to be longer the more wrong turns that the animal makes in the pool. It's going to be shorter if the animal goes straight to the platform. And you can see that um, the, the dark line here, the dark circles, are control rats. And by day two, they're pretty much swimming straight to the platform. They probably had five or ten practice trials every day. By day three, um, they're basically swimming straight, and they're swimming straight on day four and straight on day five. But rats with a lesion to the hippocampus, they do a little better from uh, day one to day two, probably just because they're not panicking as much um, by day two. But you can see they never get nearly as good as the rats that don't have the hippocampus lesion. So they're sort of in the HM situation right now where they just don't remember where they are, where the platform is. So this is potentially a 
task that's more like the task that HM will fail. Um, and it's also considered to be a spatial memory task because the what you're what you're doing when you're solving this water maze is you're remembering being in this maze before, remembering all the different positions you started from in order to construct a reasonable route to the platform. Another example of a hippocampally dependent task is the radial arm maze. The radial arm maze has eight or more different arms that go out and the researchers put food in four of the different arms of the maze. At least that's the case in this particular rat. Don't worry about the rat. He knows not to to fall off the edge. This is probably a rat early during training that's not quite used to the maze. Anyway, the test is, do they remember which four arms they go to? And again, they're using the things in the room there, those shelves, the signs on the wall to know where to go. And that animal made no mistakes. He went to four arms. He didn't go to the four arms that never had food. Um, so he's doing good. If you give an animal a hippocampus lesion, they do terrible in this task too. So it's another spatial memory task that's hippocampally dependent that animals do poorly on. Um, and that suggested that uh, either that these tasks are like tasks that HM will fail, you know, what did you do, what did you do last weekend? That kind of question is sort of like this. Do I remember which places had food or do I remember where in this room is the platform that lets me get out of the water? Or it might suggest that the hippocampus has a really special function when it comes to navigational skills, knowing your way around your environment. And there's some evidence that both of these things are true. And in the next part of this lecture, in the next video, uh, we'll get into um, some of those details.